Welcome everybody to our second virtual town hall hosted by Plan Companies. This meeting will be recorded and made available on our website to all of today's attendees. Uh, today presenting will be our CEO, Rob Francis, Plan CIO, Peter Theodopoulos, and our special guest, Attorney Martin Cabellar from the legal firm Becker and Polyakov. After a brief overview, we'll have a Q&A session with our panel. And uh, look at the bottom of your screen to see the Q&A button in your Zoom controls. From there, you can type your question. Today's panel includes uh, Dino Uliano, our Chief Revenue Officer, Astrid Garana, our Chief Operating Officer, and along with today's speakers, Rob Francis, Martin Cabellar, and uh, Peter Theodopoulos. Uh, to present today's agenda, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Dino. Dino? Thank you, Nick, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we're happy to be bringing this to you once again um, with our uh, panel today. What I'd like to do quickly is just give an overview of what we're hoping to achieve and how, and how this town hall kind of came about. Um, we received a lot of questions immediately when, when COVID-19 struck. Uh, we were getting questions not only about the services that we provide, but many of the services that other uh, vendors that we talk to, people in the field, other experts provide. So we said, why not be a resource for folks, a place for them to come, get updates, not on just from planned, but from experts in the industry. Um, so as you see, we've been having, uh, Martin Cavallar has done an amazing job, uh, our attorney answering your legal questions. Uh, this week, we're talking about communication and technology as our feature. However, you'll always be able to ask questions uh, from previous uh, town halls that we've had, or always, uh, we're always going to have the planned experts on hand to answer your questions as well. Um, every week, we hope to feature another service, uh, another vendor, another expert <clears throat> in their field, and then have them join our uh, panel every week so you can continue to come back and ask them questions as things evolve. So today, as mentioned, um, we are go our discussion is primarily focused on technology and communication. So Rob Francis is going to handle communication management of your remote teams. Um, our Peter Theropoulos is going to go over challenging moving from physical to a virtual environment, which is what we're doing right now and what we're all learning to do and how important. Uh, of course, Martin Cavallar is going to cover any of your legal and insurance questions. These town halls are for you, about you, and all about how much you interact with us. So those questions uh, will determine where we take the meeting every week, how long the meeting goes on for every week, and what the next subjects we're going to talk about. So please keep inputting your questions in that Q&A. We want to get that going. Uh, and now I'd like to turn it over to our president uh, and CEO, Rob Prince. Thank you, Dino. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I hope everyone is healthy and safe, as I said at uh, the last uh, uh, webinar, and I'll keep saying that to everybody who, can, uh, who will hear me. Uh, as discussed last week, we cannot communicate enough the importance of communication. Uh, our employees, our colleagues, our tenants, our residents, our vendors, everyone wants and needs effective communication. And right now we're in kind of unprecedented times, so there's really no playbook on how you do it, but you should do it often. You should do it in an effective way that's reliable, that's access accessible, that's consistent uh, for your teams. So this is a good way because you get more of the human touch, which I think some of us miss now, the, the video conferencing, which uh, I do love that we're putting this together and getting uh, industry experts and having a series on it. Uh, but you wanna make sure for your organization, you're doing something that feels right for you. So virtual town halls or webinars, text-based MSS, uh, SMS mess messaging that uh, Peter will talk about, other reliable forms of communication. Um, you can't do it enough. You should do it consistently. You should make sure you're doing it for your teams because they want and need this information uh, now. It's coming up, coming at us fast and fluid, and fluid, and so make sure you're doing that. Uh, our CIO, CTO, Peter Theodoropoulos, uh, is gonna discuss what he's seeing in terms of effective communication from an IT perspective and share what his experience at Plant has been like uh, in implementing the technology. So 
without further ado, Peter. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Peter Theodoropoulos. Uh, I welcome you to our uh, series of webcasts. I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and the stay-at-home directive from local jurisdictions. Uh, that That's instituted our our need to move our physical offices to a virtual environment, um, granted. So if we're taking 100 corporate employees and moving them to their home, granted 20 of them are already remote users using and they're, they're very versed in, in using the technology, but what about the ones that don't have corporate equipment that were issued to them? What about the ones that really need some training and do not know the first thing to do to, to remotely access our systems other than being able to, 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 to look and respond to emails. Um, what do you do when the, 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 the home that they're in uh, lacks security? You know, basically, you know, as, as, as simple as uh, the, the Wi-Fi password is password or no password. And, and I want to cover a couple of things. And at the, at the same time, there's a side effect of moving from virtual, from physical to virtual is the isolation. We're isolating our workforce uh, into their some space in their homes that at the same time they have their kids they have their spouses on top of them and how do you how do you take care of all that and that's what I want to share with you uh, what we've been experiencing the past month and, and the pain and what we had to go through to get to the point where we are today um, so let's talk about home equipment not having the home equipment not having the, the security not having antivirus on their PCs that are at home what we've been to do what we've done is for those that needed to access our, our resources internally we've implemented something called VPN We've had that in place. We had to scale it to make sure that we can get uh, additional users on, on staff. So VPN, virtual private networks. What it does basically is once they connect up to our office equipment or office servers, it locks out anything that's on their systems themselves. So if there's a virus on their system, it will not be able to generate uh, and, and slip into our network. It's a solid, think of it as a tunnel. You can get to it and come back, work on it and put it back on. Um, that's number one. So how do you, it's, it, it, it really comes down to how do you implement some, something like that? You would have to, one, have your IT infrastructure or network um, group or your network consultant be able to implement that. That can be done relatively qu quickly. A lot of the tools that are out there already in the cloud. You can leverage the cloud to be able to take advantage of those uh, abilities. The other thing is, you know, bandwidth contention meaning now you have the kids using Google Classroom, now you have the spouse working at home uh, on their, their uh, office, um, and then the, 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 let's say the husband and wife, all of a sudden you're, you're draining the resources. One of the things I wanna do, one, I, I wanna recommend and then not recommend is when you're on the phone and talking and if you do see a contention, don't use video. Uh, but for times that you're in groups and you need to, to, um, to have a collaborative um, and camaraderie going, use the video. Sounds weird to say that, but there's instances where you have to lower the, the bandwidth itself. And I don't know if you heard in the news, Netflix just reduced their high definition broadcasting of movies in Europe because Europe couldn't handle the, 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 the amount of uh, bandwidth to be able to stream the movies. So instead of Netflix shutting down, they lowered the, the, um, um, the, 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 the view. So now with that, you have your, your team in place, they're working effectively, you have the support team be able to help them uh, work, um, th work. but now you, what happens with that isolation? Now the isolation is, are they able to work effectively? Are they able to, um, so what we've done is we've used collaboration tools. Specifically, we use Microsoft Teams, and this is not a plug for Microsoft Teams. There's also Google Hangout, there's also other tools that are out there like Slack, and other things that are limited in some way. But the reason with Microsoft Teams that we have it, we're on a subscription plan with Office 365. And Office 365, you don't know what it is exactly. It's a subscription of you pay a certain amount of dollars a month, like $6 a month, and you get Word, Excel, PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera. And depending on the level, you also get Microsoft Teams part of it. Nice thing about a year and a half ago, Microsoft made Teams free. So even if you don't have it as a corporate tool, it is free to download and it's free to be able to use it. I wholeheartedly recommend it. It is a tool that between chatting, video conferencing, audio conferencing, sharing files, whiteboarding, and more and more and more, is it, it, it is the tool to co collaborate very effectively whether you have 20 employees or 2,000 employees. Um, it's a tool to really use um, and go on. Now there's other tools like Zoom. We're using it today for webinars. 
and there's Skype that's also free uh, that you can collaborate as well. They're out there, they're available. Um, I always get the question about, well, I'm using WhatsApp or I'm using Slack, what's the difference? There is a difference. I mean, you, they cover the chatting part of it. They don't, they don't cover the other areas of sharing um, information like files. You don't have the ability to go into groups privately and, and speak. So highly recommend that, um, especially if you're, 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 your teams are, are having a hard time collaborating with each other. Um, people factor, coming down to that is what we're, uh, how do you get them to relax? Like Rob said, communicate, communicate, communicate effectively, consistently, uh, positively. But also you can use the same tools that you're collaborating with to have um, video luncheon meetings. You know, we sit there and we talk with each other, eating, talking about the day. Uh, happy hours, I've heard a few companies do that on Fridays after 5 p.m. Um, bring your pet to work. Well, the pet's already at work because you're at home. So that's another cute thing and so on and so forth uh, with a lot of that. And lastly, to, to cover this area, um, you know, some of the companies still are, as, as matter of fact, as, as us as well, is we still have employees that are out there that are still receiving paper checks. Now with this virus and this, this whole pandemic going on, the USPS has slowed down considerably. People are afraid to touch anything that's out there. Get your employees to move to direct deposit or a pay card. I promise you they will be happy in the long run because they'll get paid exactly on time uh, when you transmit the, the funds and you don't have the headache of trying to go to the office and generate the paper checks or get them out the door, all that goes away. Um, so there's, there's quite a few things. And at the end, share some best practices with your teams so they understand it. You know, they understand saying, oh yes, I have to change the password on my Wi-Fi app. Yes, I have to put a screen password on my PC uh, after five minutes because right now I'm working at home. Anybody can walk in, whether it's a neighbor or a friend or whoever, Hopefully they're, they're practicing social distance, distancing. At the end, run the home office as an office at that point. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce you to um, Mark Calabar, uh, Martin Calabar and um, attorney. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Martin Cabalar. I'm an attorney with Becker and Polykoff, and um, I've been asked to uh, come here today to speak to you, obviously, about some communication issues you might be having in your building, but also available if you have general legal questions at the end. We'll open it up for that. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, planned companies for having me and for all the attendees for joining us today. I'm going to focus just on two areas of communication that's been coming up, coming up a lot in our communities that we represent. The first of which is how do you handle guests and visitors and then communications to your residents about these policies you might be putting in place uh, with respect to guests and, uh, guests and visitors coming to your property. Right. So depending on where you are located uh, geographically, as well as the type of your community uh, that you are in, you might have some differences about how you're going to handle your guests and visitors. Um, but the bottom line is associations have a responsibility, right, to render their common areas safe and to take reasonable actions uh, to prevent known threats. Here, we're talking uh, primarily about the the virus situation, right? So there are some things that an association could do, particularly uh, mid-rise and high-rise communities uh, with respect to limiting guests. Now, if you're operating and managing a single family home community, that's gonna be a little bit differently, uh, different than your mid-rise or high-rise community. In a mid-rise or high-rise uh, situation, each person that comes into the building who, uh, whether they're a resident or not, is bringing the outside world in with them, right? And there's all those high touch points, the elevator, the lobby, all of those things. So what you have to do is put a policy in place to restrict guests and visitors, because when you're allowing guests and visitors to come into the building, uh, you are probably somewhat significantly increasing the risk that one of them could bring the virus into the building. Right. So a lot of our mid rise and high rise buildings have put a ban on guests and visitors. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not considering special circumstances that might warrant an exception. And that does not mean at any point are you ever restricting access to emergency medical personnel coming into the building. Um, but you might be restricting access to all other guests and visitors. Um, for example, things like nannies 
dog walkers, house cleaners. Those are, are popular guests and visitors to mid-rise and high-rise building, mid high buildings that are now being restricted access. Yes, I understand that creates uh, not an optimal situation for your residents. There will be some comp complaints, but you have to all try to get through this together and understand that that's what's best for the health and safety um, of the community. So my recommendation to you is if you're considering or have in implemented these types of policies, speak with your legal counsel, speak with your team, if that's planned companies, um, and come up with uh, a, a concise uh, communication that will answer many of the questions up front for the residents about why you're putting in this policy and exactly what the policy means. Um, the other topic I want to talk about has to do with communicating to the residents uh, when you have a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19. Uh, if you go to the next slide, thank you. And this came up in a Q&A last week, but I felt like it was an important enough topic that uh, we should discuss here um, while we have this opportunity to discuss communications. First and foremost, residents cannot be restricted access to their community. Barring some order from the local, county, or state um, health authorities, you can't restrict an, a resident from getting access to their unit, um, even if they are a confirmed COVID-19 positive case. Um, if they want to come back to stay in their unit, you can't restrict them access to their unit. Um, but you should be putting in um, uh, you know, parameters so that they're, they are self-isolating for as long as they're required to by the CDC guidelines. Um, the next part of this is, can you notify residents that a member has either uh, tested positive or is presumed positive? Now, presumed positive means that um, they are exhibiting the symptoms and they have uh, visited a medical professional who's told them, we, you know, you're either gonna get the test or you're not gonna get the test, but we consider you to be presumed positive. You can no notify residents about these uh, people who have tested positive or who are presumed positive. However, that all depends on where your information comes from. You cannot rely on rumors. The information needs to come from the resident themselves, an occupant who lives with the resident, or you must have been notified by your own local county or state health official that they are either positive or presumed positive. Under no circumstance should you identify the resident by name, address, or any other personal information unless you have consent from that person to do so. That includes um, saying what floor they live on. And a lot of people have asked me, well, why, why is that intrusive? Why is that a violation? Um, because you're giving them now a clue that may help them determine who that person is. And without that person's consent, you cannot give out their medical information to the community at large. Um, so uh, with that, I will be available obviously for Q&A on these topics as well as um, any others at the end of this presentation, but that's all I have for you. And I think uh, I'm turning it back over to Dino now. Yes, thank you, Martin. So. Um... Nick, actually, could you just review this slide with the group before I go on to the next one? Sure, Dino. Uh, we have a number of resources on our COVID-19 page at plancompanies.com forward slash COVID-19. You'll be able to find recordings of this and our previous webinars. Should you have any questions after the meeting, please reach out to us at marketing at plancompanies.com. And uh, be sure to join us for next week's town hall. The topic will be virtual fitness and amenity activation. Joining us will be our friends from Live and Heartline Fitness. And uh, we will have a Q&A section coming up. Uh, remember down the, uh, on the Zoom panel, there's a Q&A button. And if you click that, you can enter your questions there. Do you know? Thank you very much. So again, this is about you. So um, everyone out there uh, who's participating, appreciate it. The numbers have been phenomenal. And I wanna thank our panelists today for doing such a great job in presenting. Um, this section, it doesn't have to be on topic. Uh, you have a lot of experts uh, here who are able to address uh, any of your questions. Uh, so we had quite a few uh, questions given to us prior to today's meeting, which we really appreciate. We can get them loaded up. Uh, I believe Nick has some of those, but don't feel that we have to uh, talk about technology, although we have a great resource on today, uh, or legal. Uh, feel free to ask any of the questions that we that you want covered today, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. So with that said, I want to turn it over to Nick, who I think is going to start our Q&A portion. 
Okay, great. Uh, we have a first question for Martin. What would your advice be concerning office staff who say they don't feel safe going to work and request to work from home, uh, specifically non-essential role, roles such as leasing agents? Okay, so there are uh, in most states now stay at home orders in place. You have to take a look at um, your individual state first and foremost about what that order says about who is permitted to work and who is supposed to be staying home. In New Jersey, for example, um, someone like a leasing agent wouldn't be someone who is um, most likely, depending in, unless they have administrative duties, permitted to go to the office. Um, that is a job that could um, generally be fully undertaken from a telework scenario, from home, from the home office. Um, so in something like that, I, I, I would find it hard pressed in most states that you're gonna find a leasing agent um, to be a, an essential worker. Now, that doesn't mean they might not have tasks that are essential. So you have to look at your state specific, specific orders. So maybe they can do 95% of their job from home, but they have to come into the office in order to do some administrative task, assuming that it's permitted in that state, um, you, you may do that, but again, it's very state specific. So make sure you talk with your legal counsel. Um, but generally, I think everyone should be doing their best efforts to move all of their operations uh, that are certainly non-essential to remote based. Uh, that is what these stay at home orders are for. I think that's what is required of all of us uh, is to do our best uh, to do our part. Hey, Martin, there was a, a question also, you mentioned about residents and how to, um, the steps to alert, um, you know, the community, what about a tenant in a commercial building? Same applies in terms of um, how they should alert if the building's active, how do they alert tenants in a commercial building? Good question, yeah, it would be the same. Um, whether it's a, a residential property where the people own condominiums or townhomes or you're in a mid or high rise uh, tenant situation, uh, you're talking about someone's personal health information. So the process needs to be the same. Um, you need to be uh, making sure you're confirming that they have actually tested pos positive from one of those three sources that I discussed before. Um, and then you shouldn't be giving out any personal information uh, without consent. You can go a lot further into the weeds with them and having discussions about what you're allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say, asking them things uh, about when they last came into contact with people who they came into contact with. They don't have to answer those types of questions, but speak with your own personal legal counsel about how far you should take it and what you should be seeking in each circumstance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we've got a question for Dino. Have we seen an uptick in theft or breaches in security within communities? Thank you, Nick. Um, we, we really haven't. Um, not an uptick, I would say more of an awareness around security, more of a uh, people are paying attention. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna add a little bit to the question because I had a friend ask me during the week uh, about the need for, you know, now that the um, prisons and some of the jails are, are letting, um, releasing some of the inmates out into the population with what's happening, um, is there a requirement uh, to go armed uh, in your buildings? I, I really don't think there is a need for that. Uh, I think right now, during times like this, being vigilant, having eyes, ears, technology, uh, reporting, observing and reporting should be the basic function of any security team. And, and with that, being more vigilant, uh, we don't need to uh, worry people or, or bring more concern around. I think if people see that, they'll, they'll become by nature more, more worried. Um, so I would suggest just more attention around security. Uh, but fortunately, we don't see an uptick uh, in properties. I haven't heard any major reports that these folks that are being let out, and by the way, they are being heavily monitored. They have to do a check-in process. There's, there's a lot that goes on with these folks that are getting um, let out now due to the virus. So um, I'll be here for the duration, of course, and if there are any other security questions, I'm, I'm happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, question for Astrid. What is the procedure to sanitize a property once a COVID case is confirmed? both in a high rise and horizontal communities. Uh, Tony's muted. You have to unmute my friend. Oh, there you go. Oh, I was there's Astrid. Oh, sorry about Whoa. that. So you want to, no different, they're all, they're all pretty much the same, but you want to call a professional company that has the staff that's trained, that has the right product and equipment to do it. Uh, if you're doing it yourself, you want to make sure that the staff is properly trained on the products, 
many different products out there at different dwell time, uh, which means that, that the time that the surface has to remain wet for it to do its job. Uh, you want to have the personal protective equipment to protect the associates that are doing it. And um, the, the best way to handle any space would be to use the electrostatic sprayers as a first because the disinfectant gets into all the hard to reach areas. But you always want to follow up with a proper spray and wipe method uh, and follow the dwell time, make sure the product is doing its job. Everybody has to be in personal protective equipment and then properly dispose of all those, uh, um, uh, the, the gear that you were using. Uh, but uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, thanks. Question for Peter. Is anyone running into supply chain issues with respect to technology mm -hmm. for those who have never been remote workers, such as webcams, laptops, headsets, et cetera? Yes, absolutely yes. We, uh, we, the, our vendors have run out of webcams. Uh, our current vendor ordered, placed an order for 20,000 webcams to come in. And because of the timeline of coming in, what we ended up doing was drop shipping uh, the webcams to our uh, to associates directly to their homes. This way, we don't have a have to have an IT uh, resource having to receive the the product in the office and then have to reship it out. So the the webcams was a big one. Um, laptops, yeah, laptops are big. The other part of that, another part of that was uh, adapters. Um, our staff now is they were so accustomed to having two monitors on their desk minimum. I, we have some that have three. Um, that uh, they didn't have the proper cables to be able to, to hook up their um, their laptops, their surfaces. So that was another one. And again, we're drop shipping them. It's working. There is a delay. Um, good question, Adam, because that's one of our biggest pains is the um, is the supplies for IT. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, question for Martin. Have cleanup costs been submitted to Association Insurance under Environmental Impairment Liability Coverage? And if so, how are the insurance carriers responding? So um, we discussed this a little bit uh, last time too. If you have a, a claim for cleanup costs or if you have a claim for business interruption for those people who are vendors on the line as a result of um, someone testing positive and having to do cleanup, um, you should submit it to your carrier. Um, we don't yet know whether it's going to be covered. In most circumstances for a condominium association, you're probably going to have an exclusion um, for the cost to clean up uh, a virus related uh, condition. Um, however, there is no clear answer yet because the insurance companies are only just getting these claims. And obviously they're careful to review them in full detail before they issue their denial letter. Um, we haven't gotten back any client yet who submitted a claim who's even gotten uh, got a denial letter or a reservation of rights letter from their carrier. There's a couple of legislative uh, re and regulatory measures that may come into place in the future, though I think it'd be very hard for um, the states to get them passed. But for example, New Jersey's trying to pass a bill requiring insurers to provide um, coverage for business interruption and business losses as a result of COVID-19. I don't think that's going to be passed. I think it'd be unconstitutional to do so because you're changing the terms of a contract. Um, but there are things out there and speak with your agent um, and speak with your attorney. But I absolutely recommend you at least try. It doesn't hurt to try to put the claim in. Um, though I would, I, I would tell you up front, it's very unlikely that you're going to be um, successful in it unless you have some specific uh, policy coverage, which most general liability policies have exclusions for something like this. Okay, Martin, thank you. Question for Rob. How much communication is too much communication? There's no communication that's, that's too much. You should overly communicate, especially during this time, as I repeatedly, say, repeatedly am saying. So uh, the more the better. Uh, if you have a large employee base that's uh, spread out, find effective ways to communicate with them, whether it's text-based text, text base or emails. But we find texting is uh, very uh, effective. Uh, holding these type of virtual panels or webinars uh, is very important. Um, setting up, I see a number of sites that set up information uh, portals that, as you mentioned earlier, that we have it planned. I see it, uh, I'm getting inundated with law firms and other uh, groups. Obviously, Martin and the group have um, their section there, which is important. Um, so, overly communicate. 
uh, everybody wants to understand, but they want to make sure it's, it's relevant, it's reliable. We're getting uh, inundated with a lot of information, so uh, verify the sources that it's coming from, uh, but, but definitely um, have a rhythm of communicating with your team and set it up and plan it out and, and uh, believe me, it'll be appreciated by your, your entire group. So overly communicate for sure. Thank you, Rob. Question for Peter. Can my work servers be infected by a home user's PC that is already infected? You have to unmute. Yeah, the answer is yes. If the digital security provisions are not in place, what's that mean? I earlier I mentioned virtual private network as being one of the options of VPN where the VPN will actually uh, lock out any um, uh, local noise or local files from being uh, uploaded to the server. But at the same time, you can also um, uh, allow the server, allow other solutions like SSL certificates being placed on there. And anything having to do with uh, antivirus should be on the server already. That's why it's very important to make sure um, to reach out to the IT department or the IT department taking care of that or your consultant be able to do that because if it's not set up correctly, the answer is yes to that. You can get infect your, your entire infrastructure um, oh boy, by one person, by one home office, if not properly secured. Wow. Okay, Peter, thank you. Uh, question for Astrid. After a COVID-19 confirmation in a given building, uh, besides the procedure to scrub clean necessary areas, are you documenting the special cleaning as well as providing it to the customer? Uh, yes, absolutely. So everything is being written up. Um, uh, what steps were taken, what cleanup took place. Uh, in many cases, we're taking pictures and uh, we're closing the loop by following up with the client after every instance. Um, I mean, Martin had spoken about before and mentioned that, you know, most likely the likelihood of them covering the insurance companies covering these cases are uh, very slim. You never know. So from property manager's perspective, you want to keep track of all that stuff. There's a separate invoice that was provided uh, and, and file a claim and see what happens. But we're absolutely um, providing that needed information to the clients, sure. Great, thank you. Question for Dino. How do you enforce the entry of visitors? Oops, I just lost my question. Nick, I think I have the question. So it was about enforcing uh, visitor entry now uh during COVID-19. Yeah, and sorry I lost it there. That's and, okay. Uh, I yeah, have yeah. it with I've job blockers and, and, and other folks that, that may need to come in. I'm gonna have Martin uh help me with the tail end of this, but I will tell you that anything that you um want to enforce in your properties that are different than before at this time, you want to definitely get the communication out to the residents. You want to inform them that this is what's happening starting on this day and ask them if they have any particular situations that, that, that could prevent them from following your new instructions. I know a lot of properties are locking down amenities. A lot of properties are changing how people come into the building. Um, so managers should be thinking about communicating it out and finding out, you know, dear residents, if, if there's a reason that this won't work for you, please let us know and we'll try to make all, alternate um, accommodations for you. But Martin, from a, from a legal standpoint, uh, I know you touched on it a little earlier. Um, so we're talking about the screening of folks coming in and how can we, how can we stop it or work with it? Sure. So um, if you need a, a questionnaire, there's one available on our uh, COVID-19 website, which you see in front of you now on the screen. Um, and if a visitor that you are going to consider permitting into the community answers yes to any of those, you can tell them they're not permitted to enter the community first and foremost. When it comes to questions like are dog walkers essential, are nannies essential, are uh, home uh, cleaning services essential, the answer is no. You can absolutely restrict the dog walkers from coming into the building. I understand that's not optimal. You might not make all of your residents happy. Um, we had this situation come up in another building, in a few buildings actually, and there are some other creative solutions that you can try to work around. Now, Am I saying you don't make an exception under any circumstances? I'm not saying that. For example, um, I think if somebody was a doctor or a nurse and they lived alone and they were, you know, doing their 12, 20 hour shift, 
maybe we try to make an exception under that circumstance, but you uh, consider each case individually and you, you can't be afraid to push back a little bit with people in, the, in these times because the health and safety of the residents is what is most important. Um, we had two residents in a building who uh, wanted their nanny because they were both working from home and they weren't able to complete, you know, work, they, they alleged. But, you know, there, we had board members who were in the exact same situation, two young kids. You have to find a way to make it work in these next 45 days. Um, if, you, if you need a, a dog walking alternative, see if a resident in the building can bring the dog down outside to the dog walker. See if a resident in the building who's out of a job and may need to make a little extra catch is willing to do the dog walking services for people in the building. And this is a time for, for the community itself to come together and, and not worry so much about the nannies and the dog walkers that they don't get to have. I get it, it's not optimal, no one's happy about it, but it's what we've gotta do to get through all of this. Thank you. Uh, question for Astrid, what steps are being taken to provide PPE to on-site staff? So at least for us, I mean, they are hard to come by now. So I'm not sure what you know others are doing, but uh, we were ahead of it a little bit. We managed to get through our partnerships and relationships, a lot of it. Um, we are running low, but other products are coming in. Um, uh, anybody you call now uh, would say, we don't have it, we don't have it. But believe it or not, the time is gonna pass. So place orders with multiple vendors out there um, and, and if you get one order in and then the other one comes right back and you don't need it, chances are they'll have somebody else to sell it to. So from a perspective of what you could do, place multiple orders with multiple vendors, one of them will come through at some point. But for us, uh, we're, we're pretty stocked up and um, we're, we're, we're still waiting for some things to come in, but our associates are provided with the needed PPEs to complete their jobs. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, question for Rob. Have boards been receptive to virtual meetings? I think they're more receptive now than they were in the past. And I think if there's maybe one positive and we all get to the other side of this is that maybe we'll have more virtual meetings like this where um, we can spend more time with our family and then jump on a video conference and uh, not have to deal with travel. Uh, a board could run late and say, hey, you're on in 15 or, or 20 minutes. Uh, oh, sorry, I was getting... can you see me still? I hope. Yes. Good. Yeah, we see. All right. Yeah, so hopefully, you. a good offshoot will be that we could we could maybe have more virtual meetings. I'm for planned. I've been having a number of our um, executive meetings now, obviously virtually, and uh, we're having a number of group meetings or ops teams meetings where you get to see the individuals. But now everybody's being more respectful of the time. So. Yeah, I'd love to see more virtual meetings. I think there'll be a push for it. So thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. A question for Martin. Rental properties, residents asking for rent relief. What should a response be? So a lot of states are already putting uh, moratoriums on evictions. Uh, New Jersey, I believe New York, Pennsylvania have all done this already. Uh, so check, see what state you're in. Um, with that, obviously an eviction is a landlord's um, you know, a uh, strongest negotiating tool to try to get a resident to pay. It's, it's, the, it's the leverage that you have. However, in light of those circumstances where you're no longer able to use that tool, if a resident is asking for rent relief, try to um, find out if their circumstances of being unable to pay are a result of COVID-19. For example, were they laid off? Were they furloughed? Um, you can ask for, you know, speak with your attorney about it, but you can certainly ask for documentation to show that they were laid off or furloughed. And, and my recommendation is this is going to be a tough time for everyone, especially landlords, um, because once their employees are laid off or, or, or I'm sorry, once their tenants are laid off or furloughed, that means that they're not going to have the income stream that they had before. And it's a trickle down effect. So my recommendation to, to landlords, community association boards is if someone comes to you with the problem first, do what you can to seek documentation, but consider trying to get a payment plan in place. Some money is better than no money. If it's out of the question, not an option, um, see if you can come to an agreement about how they will catch up once they get their job back, particularly if they're furloughed, and try to get a future payment plan in place. Um, if they stick to that plan 
you can incentivize it by telling them, look, we'll, we'll, leave, uh, we'll waive late fees and, and anything else, attorney's fees, if you stick to the plan. Now, obviously, if they don't, that's a different scenario. Um, and just quickly, since we're talking about all communities here too, if you have a condominium association, this does not mean you don't continue to record your liens. You might come to a payment plan with somebody, you might come up with an agreement, but given the current circumstance, our recommendation to our clients is you still take your general collection steps. You still secure your interest. You still record your liens. Um, though you, you have a, a, an agreement with the owner in writing as to a payment plan or the waiver of late fees and things of that nature. Sure. Um, if they meet that payment plan. But I think everyone has to be a little bit reasonable in these times and it doesn't benefit you to be uh, a, a strict, you know, um, enforcement or enforcer because you don't have the courts uh, and the power of eviction. Um, so, you know, in the long run, um, it's probably best to try to work out a payment plan and come up with something. But talk talk to your to your tenants, talk to your residents. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah. A question for Peter. My employees use WhatsApp you mentioned Microsoft Teams, which is better to use. The biggest Peter? difference between WhatsApp and Microsoft Teams, although both of them have group chatting, is Teams provides a workspace to access other areas of the day-to-day -day, um, working lives of the associate. Um, the ability to share notes, to whiteboard, to sh um, we don't even use the phones uh, within the office. Majority of us, we're using Teams to be able to call up through a video call, one employee to another, or departmental meetings are just join now, the whole team's on, on, on the actual call through Teams. So again, the, the, the internet is, is, is being used significantly when these calls are being made, but again, the, the, the ability to have the video and the ability to have the speakers and the, and the and again, we talked about the webcams not being available and having the webcam available, it, it, it does bring the, 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 um, the teams closer um, and it's more embraced. It's being adopted more and more lately because of the situation that we're in. So difference is it, you're, you're productive in a work environment versus just chatting uh, as a group through, um, through WhatsApp. Um, and if WhatsApp is driving you crazy um, and you wanna improve the communications and the collaborations, you should try out Teams itself. And again, it's not a plug. Also, Google Hangouts is a very good product as well. We just use Teams and uh, we know it very well. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Question for uh, Astrid. Differences between surface cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. I have to learn how to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, the surface cleaning, obviously, is just removing of any kind of residue that's built up, dust, dirt, grime, anything like that. Uh, sanitizing is reducing the amount of bacteria that, that you have in a surface, not necessarily killing it because the product is a sanitizer, not a disinfectant. Uh, disinfecting it is the way you want to go in this case because that means that you are uh, uh, killing all of the viruses and bacteria. Um, and that's pretty much the difference. So in this case, definitely go with disinfectant. Sanitizing is just reducing it. And... Um, uh, surface cleaning is just removing the dirt. Thank you. Question for Rob. How to manage associates during the crisis from an HR perspective? Uh, again, from an HR perspective or from any company perspective is give them uh, the most updated and, and right information as quickly as you can. Um, be very, uh, you can't, you know, be very um, respectful of the fact that it's a very anxious time. So, um, try to be there for them. Uh, understand if, if there is an issue, um, try to understand what that is and uh, walk them through um, you know, the steps of what that might mean in terms of if someone's not feeling well, what they should do, um, if, um, if they need to contact different agencies to have that information readily available. Uh, but just to make sure that you're giving them, uh, as Astrid mentioned earlier too, you know, the right supplies, the right equipment, the right information, and just being there for them, you know? They're, uh, they wanna make sure that you, you understand what their uh, anxiety is and their concern. So just, just make sure that you're, you're on top of it, would be my response. Okay, thank you, Rob. Question for Dino. Are all of plans services considered essential? Yes, 
<clears throat> excuse me, yes, all of plans, janitorial, maintenance, front desk, and security staff are considered essential. I want to ask, I'm going to bring Martin in on my, my question again. So helpful because I know things are changing um, day to day. And there is a piggyback question to this <clears throat> that I'm seeing in the questions here about landscapers. Uh, Martin touched on it uh, earlier this week on another panel I was with. I was wondering if there was anything new, <clears throat> Martin, around landscapers. Yeah, so uh, New York has now issued an order saying that landscapers are not essential. New Jersey has not done that yet. And if you go to our page for COVID-19, there is a list that we were able to obtain that was passed out to law enforcement in New Jersey um, that actually list out all the, the entities that would be considered a, a essential. Well, maybe not all of them, but is it's designed to allow law enforcement law enforcement to better understand the governor's executive order if it needs to be enforced at any point. Um, and on that, it says landscapers are essential and they're still permitted to work. And so in New Jersey, landscaping is still essential with respect to the extent of the services they can provide. They could do anything they would normally do outside um, so long as they're adhering to social distancing and uh, also the CDC's uh, sanitation and general hygiene uh, recommendations. So they can continue to operate in New Jersey, though that could change any day. New Jersey has um, thus far done a lot of the same things that New York has done and a day, two or three later sometimes. So just, you know, keep an eye out for that. But as of the current moment, the governor actually also supplemented his prior order and specifically said landscaping services are permitted. Thanks, Martin. Okay, thank you. Uh, another uh, question for Martin. There's so much out there already and a lot of information is redundant. How should a manager filter out what to send? So when it comes to communication and you're talking about sending communications out to the community at large, there are so many sources you can get information from right now. And as Rob was saying earlier, you, you know, you've got to make sure you're um, communicating information based on reliable sources. So always rely on your professionals. If you're working for a management company, obviously you're putting out the communications that your company is directing you to put out. That is your company is advising you to put out. But if you're talking about communications that you want to put out to residents about COVID-19, involve your legal counsel in the discussion, um, involve somebody like a planned companies in the discussion, because at the end of the day, if you're going to be putting in a new visitor policy, planned companies needs to know what is that policy? How are we going to enforce it? How are we going to establish it? Maybe you're going to change the access to your building and only allow key entry or fob entry. You got to make sure that one, you can do that and keep all your fire safety exits still accessible in the event of an emergency, right? So you got to involve uh, a, like a planned companies or a, your other vendors to make sure that um, they're on board and they fully understand the plan that you're trying to execute. That's why communication is so important. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for Dino, security wise, what should we be thinking about now that uh, we weren't before the uh, COVID-19 situation? Well, I think social distancing changes a lot around security, especially in your buildings and communities. Uh, you absolutely wanna keep space, you know, protecting our staff. And I know Astrid has brought it up uh, several times on our calls here. You want to make sure that uh, we keep our staff safe, your staff safe in these buildings. Um, having a familiar face will make everyone uh, feel better in their buildings. And, and, the close, and the more distance we can create uh, in your buildings uh, around the staff would make for a better, safer environment in the fact that they know your building better than anyone who would have to replace them. Locking down entrances, I mentioned before, uh, that, you're, that don't need to be of use. Uh, using uh, less ways to get into the building, screening who's in the building uh, closer, making sure that we're keeping an eye on folks uh, who, who may be uh, alone right now, uh, communicating with them, uh, packages. I, I think we should handle packages different than we had in the past before COVID-19. Um, some of the buildings are delivering packages now uh, to the unit. So they're calling ahead, you have a package down here rather than bringing the resident down to the lobby, telling them that we'll be dropping off your package uh, when you go up either knock on the door that their package is there um, i think changing up the package system during COVID 19 is, is critical lingering in your lobbies and and with staff or, or hanging around downstairs um, i think is critical that you uh, tell people not to do that during this time 
uh, before. Uh, yep, the front desk folks were the center of the universe for a lot of the properties and everybody's friend. Uh, now's the time that we want to keep them safe and, and away from, from residents and tenants in the buildings. Um, I would also just say, you know, as, as clean an environment as you can possibly have to not only keep uh, better security, but the safety of the staff that are providing the security. Some folks I mentioned in, uh, on, on our last town hall are creating the barrier that you're seeing in some of the shopping stores now where a plastic divider between the staff at the front desk, especially, and, and people who, uh, who need to approach. Uh, these are some basic changes that I think need to be done. We'll keep an eye on things uh, as things keep going. And uh, for sure, uh, every week I'll be on these calls, so I'll be able to talk to you about whatever I find that's new. Just to piggyback real quick on uh, what Dino just mentioned, something as simple as putting tapes on the floor in front of the the desk, uh, you know, some of the buildings are doing that. We're doing that now. We're cone or retractable tape, like you see on the on the airports, uh, and partnering up with the janitorial staff. So uh, the, the porters and matrons and that team is out and about on the property anyway, uh, as they're going out and about, perhaps taking some of the hours and allocating them to delivering the packages, so you don't have to have the residents come in and out. So. Uh, Things like this. I mean, this really is a partnership with every department in the building, and uh, it takes everybody to keep everybody safe and, and, and healthy. So, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And and just before we we continue on here, I see we have just a, we're approaching the end of the hour here. Uh, we're approaching. We we have enough questions in the queue now to get us a, where I think we can answer the remaining of the questions. So. We're gonna go ahead and do that. If you wanted to add questions, we, we're, we'll leave uh, the lines open after today's presentation. We'll take your questions, we'll get your answers. And in addition to that, all week, uh, you can continue to send us questions and, and we'll make sure we answer them either uh, on the next town hall or, or immediate, immediately. Thank you for that. All right, thanks, Dino. Uh, question for Peter. On a texting platform, what would be considered an alert versus a notification? If you need an alert to go out instantly, would a texting platform be instant? So when we when we say alert, I would think it's an emergency alert, something that needs to get out to the um, to the recipient, versus a notification, which means you're not notifying them, um, but perhaps it's okay if they look at it ten minutes later or thirty minutes later. I don't recommend texting for emergency alerts for many reasons. Why? Uh, number one, um, if the recipient doesn't have a good signal, they're not going to get it. If the recipient's uh, mobile device doesn't is not powered up with battery, they're not going to get it. If an emergency situation, whether it's a fire in the building or something, I, I, it, I what I would recommend from an emerger, emergency alerting is having multiple uh, communication protocols, meaning text, perhaps an email, perhaps somebody calling. No matter what, you need to get them out of the building uh, in a circumstance like that. Notifications are perfect for um, through texting. Because at the end, they're going to get it, whether they, they powered up their phone they, and then all of a sudden the text came in, they will get it. It's the, one of the most reliable or, or the re most reliable um, protocol to use. As right. I mean, what, what does statistics say? What? What percentage will read it after a certain amount of time? I mean, in a notification, it's absolutely ideal. 90, yeah, 96% uh, of received messages are read within six minutes. Absolutely. A, but, it, but in an emergency person. situation, you're, you're spot on. In an emergency, you want to make sure they're alerted. So you can text, but you should call. You should make sure that, that the, the individual has received an emergency message because same way that we want to make sure the emergency uh, personnel and the tenants or residents are getting the messaging and the, hearing the alarm or whatever the situation might be for the emergency, you want to make sure that they receive that message. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Martin. Regarding communication to commercial tenants in a mid uh, or high rise building, if an LL is told by a tenant that one of their employees is tested positive, is that LL required to notify the other tenants in the building? So yeah, in a commercial setting, if a commercial landlord is notified that a employee in one of their commercial tenants um, one of the employees from one of the commercial tenants has tested positive. I do think they have an obligation to notify uh, the building. Again, you can't disclose personal information. 
shouldn't even disclose the company that they work for, just that an employee in the building has notified uh, management or the landlord that there has been a positive test. And then of course, to calm their nerves, let them know what you're doing about that. Let them know what your plan is to address that. How are you going to clean it? How are you going to attack it? Are you going to close down areas? So, you know, talk to your legal counsel, you know, specifically about that. But again, have a plan in place, communicate that plan clearly um, and uh, uh, concisely. But I do think you, you have an obligation at that point um, to tell the rest of the building. And I, I know, uh, for example, in our building, um, uh, we had actually been informed of a positive test in the building next to ours. They went so far as to even tell because we shared the cafeteria and people would traverse back and forth. Now, this was a couple of weeks back when this all first started, um, but our landlord, uh, you know, did let us know in our building, our office had, had already been closed at that time, but I do think you have the obligation, yes. Okay, Martin, and uh, there's another one. Um, with stay-at-home orders in place, if you're providing a disinfecting service as a part of other services, would we be considered essential? What would the employees need to provide to, pr to uh, prove this? Sure. Um, so the disinfecting service part of your business would be considered essential. Um, if you were undertaking some other type of business that wasn't included in the list, then obviously, no, you wouldn't be able to continue to do that part of the service. But strictly with respect to the question of disinfe disinfecting, yeah, you'd continue to be able to do that. Um, the reality of the situation is your employees are probably not going to be pulled over by the police to see if they have a letter from the company saying the service that they're providing. But that is what the governor's order requires, is that the company provide their employees letters describing that they are an essential employee, here's what they're doing, and you might even add, here's the hours that they're doing it within. Um, because if it ever gets to that point, then they have that letter and you don't have to scramble to get it. But um, in discussions we've had with um, uh, family members of state police um, who've been on some other calls, they've all told us, look, at the end of the day, they're not pulling people over uh, right now anyway. Uh, I don't know that they even have the resources to be able to do that. But, um, you know, this is kind of a, you know, trust basis that everyone's got to operate under. So uh, I, I think you should give them the letter and have it describe the services that they're providing and that it's essential. Okay, and Martin, uh, uh, another question. Um, if you know your neighbor died and you see a professional company come into a home, can you assume they died from the virus? And what is the responsibility of the board to notify the community? Okay, so um, if you know a neighbor died, no, you cannot assume that they died from the virus. This still goes back to you have to have it confirmed prior to their passing from the resident that they had the virus um, or that they were presumed positive to have the virus. But if they were only presumed positive to have the virus, then you cannot communicate to the community that they died from the virus. Um, so at, at that point, there is no obligation to notify the community that um, somebody passed away just because they passed away. You gotta get the information from the resident themselves, an occupant, uh, of occupant of the unit, or like I said, the, the local or um, uh, county or state uh, health code uh, authorities that um, they had it. Um, I would also in that circumstance say you could rely on a direct close uh, uh, family member, a spouse, a, a, a sibling, a parent. Um, if they provided you that information, then yes. Um, if you wanted to get into procedures of what you do after that, um, again, limit, limit the communication, like I said, without providing any personal information. Um, and then obviously you know, speak with your attorney, speak with your folks at Planned Companies about how you're gonna go about cleaning uh, now that you know that that has happened and nobody should be going into that unit in any uh, uh, emergent sense. Um, you know, so you know, you're gonna have to have a discussion and communicate with everyone about that. Hey, thank you. Do you know? Thank you, everyone, for attending uh, some great questions today. And thank you, panelists, for, for your tremendous answers. Uh, I would certainly say, Martin, you, you are essential uh, here for this town hall. And we, uh, we definitely appreciate all the, uh, all the legal advice. Um, remember, we're going to keep the lines open here for some time. Uh, please, uh, you can still click on Q&A. And, and what I'd like to see in the Q&A or other topics 
Uh, a lot of folks have hit us up. A lot of people have asked for things that they want to see coming up. This is for you. This is a weekly town hall uh, for, to bring you resources. So please continue to let us know what it is you want to talk about. I'll tell you, fitness at home is becoming a huge thing and, and activating your home amenity spaces right now uh, is huge, uh, converting areas in your home. So I'm, I'm interested and, I, and I'm looking forward uh, to next week's town hall. Uh, don't wait till the last minute. We'll continue to have, we'll keep adding to our panelists. So the questions that you answer now or you have now, our panelists will be back. We'll, we'll always be here to continue to answer and support you and, and, and handle any questions you may have. So I just want to once again thank, we had a huge uptick in participants. We will be looking at the participant list uh, after today's town hall when we wrap up here and we had a referral contest happen. So if you refer a friend uh, for next week too, uh, you'll be in the drawing. Uh, we have a gift card to, what was it for again, Nick? Uh, coffee, right? Uh, Starbucks. We have a Starbucks gift card that we'll be virtually sending to you um, so that you can have it. But please uh, encourage more uh, friends and, and family and people out there who, who could benefit from this town hall to continue to join that, join us. So with that said, we are going to leave the line open for you. You can continue to add Q&A. And panelists, thank you. We can, uh, we're gonna shut down our faces now and uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Dino, thanks team. Thanks everyone for joining in. Be healthy. It's great. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank thanks. you everybody.